Hello and welcome to this month's edition of Telco Talk. I'm Eleni Jokos. Now the concept of letting someone else run some or even all of your in-house IT services has become increasingly popular amongst businesses known as managed services. Providers are offering clients tailor-made technology solutions to manage their IT device and even connectivity needs. Joining me in studio now to take a closer look at the concept of managed services, Angus Hay, Chief Technology Officer at Neotel and Raj Waniapa, Executive at Carrier Services at Internet Solutions. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for joining us today. Managed services, I think let's start off with a definition of what it actually means for corporates today. Well, I think managed services refers to the instance when the services, ICT services, are delivered by a service provider um, to a client uh, instead of the client themselves running that service. It can be done in a number of different fashions. It can be done either using uh, either in-house or it can be done in a hosted manner using te technology and infrastructure which is owned by the client or potentially owned by the service provider. Angus, yeah. your sense? No, I think certainly that Raj has captured the essence of it. I think what's important though is that the, the, the term he used, ICT, is quite important. Uh, there, there was a time when we looked at IT services and telecom services as being very distinct. Today they're not really separate. So a lot of what uh, were historically regarded as IT services are actually today really moving into the cloud. They're moving into the hosted space. Uh, and we look at managed services not just covering the, the, the management of, for example, server infrastructure, but all the way through up to application software in the hosted space. And then obviously on-site services, which was also mentioned, which is really about having people uh, outsourced to, to do the services for you. Oh, I'm glad you mentioned uh, the cloud and cloud computing. We know that uh, within the space, this has obviously been something that's relatively new and everyone is jumping on this bandwagon. Raj, when you look at the managed services space right now, could we say, could we comfortably say that that is a new trend when you look at the cloud? Yeah, certainly what we're seeing is that there's a trend towards cloud, but I don't think the viewers should get confused that managed services equals cloud uh, or even hosting per se. Uh, so they are different concepts. Uh, they are interrelated. So uh, if you recall the days of the answering machines, uh, no one has those anymore. All of those have gone into the cloud. Uh, telco operators are offering that. Uh, clients, consumers do not have to have that capability. So that's an example of a managed service that's offered by operators uh, in the cloud. But it's not necessarily everything to do with the cloud. And of course, um, you were talking about the distinction between ICT and IT, and now that, uh, of course, that gap does not exist anymore. Angus, what has changed for you no. uh, with the uh, growing the, environment? The, the key is services? that um, whether you're looking at dedicated services, so in other words, a managed service which is run entirely for a corporate, um, if you like, as a as a, a, a private service, or you're looking at some kind of shared service. Uh, in both those cases, one of the big barriers to using hosted services, in other words, services which are not on site, has always been the communications. And what we've seen increasingly is with the opening up of communications, with broadband, with the fiber communications, we, we're able to create um, a much more seamless connectivity between the hosted environment and the, uh, the on-site uh, or the connectivity required to the premises of the customer. And, and the, the bigger those pipes, the, the more free flow of information, the easier it has become to run managed services which are not physically on site. Is that now what differentiates essentially managed services from the traditional IT support scenario? I, I think it's, it's partly that because there are different kinds, but I think what, as, as Raj said, you can't automatically say that because it's, uh, it's, it's off site that it's automatically a managed service. It's perhaps the other way around is that some managed services are off site, some managed services are on site. Um, what has changed is that uh, we're able to do a lot more uh, in a hosted environment today because of the availability of connectivity back to customer's premises. And how does this change the productivity within a company if you are, of course, outsourcing your services within the IT space? Does it change things? We know that a lot of companies uh, embark on this because they want to focus on their core businesses. Yeah, I think there is gains to be made both from uh, the user's perspective as well as from the company's perspective. I mean, from a company perspective, uh, by going managed services where they have the access to best of breed products, things like security, ensuring the right uh, patches, security patches are being done at scale. There's no doubt that a managed service provider is able to provide services, similar services, much more 
effectively, cost effectively, and uh, much more uh, uh, if efficiently than uh, a normal corporate client because they have ability to leverage scale, they have ability to uh, leverage the number of engineers that they need and actually reduce that. I mean, uh, take an example such as uh, video conferencing. I mean, today, uh, you know, the days of having your own uh, video conferencing uh, equipment and bridges, et cetera, are gone. You just need the end user devices, and then from there, uh, it's all been done, uh, you know, uh, remotely hosted, uh, and, and that individual company does not have to have the skill to be able to deliver and use such services. And of course, yeah. buying up the latest technology, obviously a very costly exercise for each corporate out there. Yeah. I, I, I like that example. It's, it's perhaps at the high end of managed services because it's really getting even perhaps beyond the realm of just IT and, and ICT services. Um, we, we operate a global telepresence capability, for example, um, and we, we, we partner with Cisco um, on a global basis with that. In that environment, we, we go one step beyond simply delivering um, a managed environment that the user has exclusively for his own use. We actually op operate public telepresence rooms where you literally hire the room for an hour. Now, that is a fully managed service. Um, you, you, re you book it the same way that you book um, a restaurant or an airline ticket. You, you phone up or you book online. You simply book the, the slot. You pay a fee for that slot and you use the service just when you require it. And I think that's the ultimate example of, of, a, of, a, of a truly shared service. Um, but I think there are many others in between. Uh, if you just look at the, 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 the things that are required and, and the things that really make a difference with managed services, obviously there's the shared aspect. I think we've, we've spoken a bit about that. So in other words, there's um, the, the provider, the service provider is able to invest not just in, in physical infrastructure, but the other thing that the service provider is able to invest in is expertise. And that's really where the managed component of managed services comes in. It's becoming increasingly difficult for most corporates to have the level of skills. Security is a very good example. Um, it's a very dangerous world out there uh, in, in the internet and the, um, the, the, the communications world. The kind of expertise that you need to protect your infrastructure, to protect your IT systems, is not something that you can necessarily hire as a corporate or an enterprise. As it stands in South Africa right now, would you say that we've uh, started maturing as a market? Uh, we know that a lot of corporate companies are starting to embark on more requests for outsourcing and managed services. Are we at that level yet? Yeah, I think the stats say that's probably something around 50% of ICT services in the next uh, five years uh, will be delivered in either managed service, hosted, or outsourcing fashion. And the old adage that you know uh, mission critical systems should be kept in house and all the rest should be uh, outsourced, uh, I think uh, is turning to be tr uh, untrue. I mean, today, and just look at the example, uh, you know, with RIM being down, is email is a mission critical tool. Uh, there's no uh, ways the organization can actually function without that. But in many instances, those are, uh, are, are out, uh, uh, hosted and outsourced. So that's probably a bad example of it happening. But certainly what we're seeing is things like um, uh, telephony uh, using uh, hosted IP PBXs. You know, PBXs uh, are going to be dead. There's no uh, need to have uh, PBXs in-house. Uh, that all will be delivered in the cloud in a managed service fashion. Yeah. It's a good example. I think we're all familiar with the, the very stressed IT guy who gets called in because just nothing is working in your office. Absolutely. I mean, there was a lot of trust put into research in motion, and we know that there's devastation that is acro going across various continents. And that is the point, that you're actually trusting uh, the company that you, you are um, allowing to manage your services, and things can go wrong, yeah. and they do go wrong sometimes. Yeah. I think the lesson to be learned there is that, look, th no, no system is perfect, and, uh, and one has to look at each provider in their own right. Um, I think what is certainly true, and this is, a, in, if you think about it, a little ironic, is that the same companies that have put massive trust in providers such as RIM um, will, will uh, sometimes think twice about whether they would outsource some other critical component of their, of their services. And, what we are seeing is that, that crossover. So it's almost as if services which were once regarded as kind of on the consumer fringe and, and just kind of entering into, into the, the enterprise space are often trusted in the cloud. They're often trusted out there despite the fact that uh, you know, there are risks and yet uh, companies won't take uh, things that they do in-house today which are actually quite complex like security. Um, and, and, and just outsource them. But uh, we are seeing a change. We are seeing, particularly in South Africa, that, uh, that companies have learned to trust. 
So no longer do you get told, no, you can't bring your Apple device into the company and have it incorporated. So there is a trust building up that the, the systems out there can be secure. Lines from London to the JSC have failed this year. We know Neotel lines uh, drop often as well. Telcom has had a problem. MTN, and that is the reality that when you start outsourcing that you do have this risk. Is that the biggest risk that corporates face? I think in terms of managed services, what's key is what you talked about earlier, which is trust and the trust that you place in your service provider. Uh, it's up to the service provider to look at the right levels of redundancy, ensuring that, for instance, uh, international cables are both from the East Coast and the West Coast, so that you don't have just one single option. Another issue is, is what we call vendor lock-in. Uh, a service provider can look at the best of breed and, and make sure that they, they can use what's best available at the right time. Whereas if an individual corporate client has to purchase it, they're probably locked into that solution for the next five to eight years. So that's where the trust of the service provider to ensure that the latest security patches, the la latest standards, the latest practices in alignment to things like ITIL and, and, and other practices, ISO, have to come in and with the right level of redundancy. And it is possible and we are able to deliver significantly high levels of reliability uh, in a very professional manner. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm going to respond to your comment about Neotel lines. Uh, <laughs> Please can do, I, Angus. Well, I mean, I, I think you need to remove the word often. Um, we, we we, run no, I very said we, we've seen it happen across the board it, with, it all certainly the, does happen, uh, but with all the providers, not only yeah. one company, but many. We, we operate at a, at a very, very high level of availability. We've got a continuous tracking of our availability on our lines. Um, and the, the, the core availability of our network operates you know, beyond 99.9% .9 availability in the core. Um, well, interesting example on submarine cables because we've also had um, some issues on the Seacom cable in the last week. Um, the Seacom cable has had a serious outage. Um, what is interesting, of course, is that Neotel's customers haven't noticed. And the reason that Neotel's customers haven't noticed is that we have redundancy across multiple cable systems. So our um, customers on internet, for example, would not have noticed a single packet drop despite the fact that an entire cable system went down. Now, I think that's the kind of reliability and redundancy that one looks for from a service provider side. So Angus, yeah. would you say that you know, the consumer or the client is reliant on you and you are actually reliant on something bigger that is actually occurring, like the Seacom cable, and the Seacom cable is obviously reliant in terms of what's happening in, in Europe and the Middle East. Should we start bringing things to the continent? That's an interesting debate. I mean, we've always, always been a supporter of what we call the hosting homecoming revolution. Yes. <laughs> people, have, people have pushed uh, services offshore for primarily cost reasons. Um, now, that's not to say that it's not a good idea. There are often very good reasons. We, we for example, uh, because we work together with Tata Communications, which is a global player, we actually use that advantage of geography to create redundancy in different geographies. So, for example, we'll be running the, 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 the network operating s center for the WAX cable with one uh, center in Johannesburg and a backup center sitting in India. Now, that's the way you pr provide solid redundancy. But we do feel strongly that bringing the managed services into South Africa, bringing the skill set into Africa is very important. And that's something which we're starting to be able to do um, more so than pre previously. There was a tendency to just assume that because it's in Europe or because it's in the US, it's better. Um, that's not automatically the case, Absolutely. particularly when you're looking at communications. And especially when you're looking at what's happening now. Uh, Raj, would you agree with that? Do you think that there's opportunity within this space? No, absolutely. As a, as, a, as a company that operates across Africa, first of all, uh, we want our infrastructure to be based in Africa, certainly South Africa, but even there there is political and other dynamics that come into play that requires us to be uh, having uh, infrastructure in East Africa, in West Africa, and in North Africa. Uh, that inherent architecture ensures redundancy because if we en if we have more than one for instance data center even region we're able to uh, if one fails we're able to deliver the same services through another so that's what uh, ultimately uh, the market wants uh, they don't want things to go down to fail uh, and and the service provider has to have the necessary backup like in the case of Seacom, similarly, you know, we didn't have any outages for our clients. Fantastic. We're taking a very short break, and when we come back, more on managed services. Stay tuned.